Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll call the meeting of the Community Justice Collaborating Council uh, to order. We do have a quorum, so I'll dispense with roll call. Uh, the minutes from our July 11 meeting were included in your packets. Are there any additions or corrections to those minutes? Hearing none, they'll stand approved as submitted. Uh, we welcome Ellen Thompson from uh, Western Wisconsin Health today. She is filling in for the administrator, Ms. Peterson, so we welcome her today. Uh, is there, are there any public comments? Uh, any public comments today? Seeing none, we'll move on to the business items. Executive Committee uh, was asked to look at a couple of uh, changes to our bylaws. First, I think you know we have a very robust uh, pretrial services program now in the county, thanks to the efforts of uh, Dr. Ghali and, and his crew. And it made sense to add, in our opinion anyway, the uh, pretrial services unit supervisor who currently would be Shelby Hilden. Uh, Shelby started, I think, as a jailer and then moved into drug testing when that was being done by the Sheriff's Department. When we opted to take that out of the Sheriff's Department, she then uh, became a member of, of this particular department and has really done significant work uh, not only in developing that program, but in some of the statistical information and reports that the judges are getting and others are getting. So that would be one change to add the uh, pretrial uh, services coordinator, supervisor as an advisory member. The other change that we're proposing would be under subcommittees, which is section C on page eight of the bylaws to add a county board supervisor uh, to all of our standing committees. Uh, I guess by default, we have county board members on a few of our committees, but it made sense that it would be useful to have that connection, that tie to uh, the county board uh, relative to our subcommittees. We talked to the chairman. Uh, he thought that that likewise uh, was a good idea, so we are making that proposal as well. So those are the two changes that are being recommended by executive committee. So is there a motion to approve those two changes? Thank you, motion by Sheriff Knudsen. Is there a second? Second by Supervisor Telejohn. Any discussion about those two changes? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Those opposed, same sign. Carried unanimously. Thank you. There are a couple of other things that uh, we just need to clean up, and Phil and I and Kate will work on those. It's, it's primarily now that we're no longer, uh, uh, we have a separate department for pretrial services. We just need to, again, update some of our language. And then we'll look forward to uh, the chair of the county board appointing uh, members to our open committees, and I think Phil's provided a list to Chairman Long about what committees we would like to have representation on. Uh, Justice Support Services testing updates, Phil. And also I should uh, Phil uh, provide all of us with our uh, peanut butter crispy bars or the, uh, the rice crispy bars he shared that I think a manager or someone who uh, was involved with Best Made, used to be his neighbor, so he and his family became very attached to Best Made and <laughs> their products, so uh, he, he provided treats today, so we'll thank him for those. Phil. Yeah, and if you have a peanut allergy, I apologize. There are a couple of the marshmallow ones floating around, so <laughs> Travis, I think that's yours. Yeah. Um, okay, so testing updates, just recap of maybe the last six months. So we've been offering testing not only here at the Government Center in Hudson, but in New Richmond at the Services Center um, for, again, the last six months. So uh, Tuesdays and Fridays, we're testing up there. Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, testing here in Hudson. Again, anecdotally going well. I think at the last meeting in July, I presented some statistics about the percentage of people we were testing in each location. Um, I think it was roughly maybe a third of individuals testing in New Richmond, two-thirds here, which would kind of track with the number of days per week. Um, and we can report back on that um, as we do with other pretrial statistics. 
Um, testing here at the government center will fully transition from downstairs um, where Justice Support Services currently is located right by the sheriff's office. Uh, the week of Monday, October 21st, it will move upstairs to the south uh, south addition, the second floor, where our new department will be. Um, so we'll be getting messaging out, and I've talked to department heads um, about uh, the departments that we test for, diversion and children's services, about helping us get that message out to clients um, that will be making that move. So um, that's, that'll be a big change. Um, the week before that, which is Monday, October 14th, we're going to move all testing to New Richmond uh, because our staff will be moving that week, and it would be a lot to coordinate moving and testing people. So we're going to move testing off-site for that week. Um, I think those are probably the biggest updates. I, I just mentioned um, for just staffing reasons, and, and we have a lot of moving parts in justice support. We offer a lot of different programs and services. Uh, we are going to keep our 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday hours. Um, those will remain uh, fixed for right now. I mean, they're subject to change at any time. Um, our, we do have staff coming back from leave, so we're getting closer to being fully staffed. Um, but we are still backfilling as a department, and, and so we want to keep those hours. And I, again, I will acknowledge that um, it's tight for some of our clients uh, who work and have children. Very much understand that. However, I would maybe counter my own argument by saying that a lot of, I think, the folks that we test for are getting used to those hours and they make it work either early in the morning, coming home from work on their lunch break. And so we're going to keep that going. Um, I don't know if there's anything else. Does anybody have any questions about testing? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So I have Heather next to me. <laughs> Adult treatment court updates. Uh, Judge Nordstrand's not here, so Kate, why don't you share with us what's happening sure. with the uh, treatment? Just a few brief things. Um, we're hovering around 16 participants. We like to cap it around 20, so doing well there. The big drugs that we are seeing right now are fentanyl and DMT. Fentanyl has become huge around the area, especially with our high risk participants. Um, we are also watching now that there is new drugs. Xylazine is a step higher than fentanyl and also a new drug called W18. So we are watching for that, seeing how we can test for those. The DMT, we have run into issues with DMT. It's an hallucinogenic kind of like mushrooms that they crush down. You cannot test that in any lab around this area at all. Um, the only testing that we can find from the state coordinator's office is testing in Europe for this. Mm. Police officers can test DMT if they have the actual substance, but we cannot test it once it's digested in the body and it's also out of the body within 12 to 24 hours. So we are having the issue that we have participants now using DMT and we cannot test for it. Also, um, we have been looking at our referrals lately. We are getting a lot of referrals from the DOC, but we need referrals from the Public Defender's Office. We just started that conversation this week in treatment court. We are seeing an influx of extremely high-risk participants, and they are on the back end of they need residential treatment but not just residential treatment. They need a six month to a year long program to actually be successful because their substance abuse is so bad. Right now in Wisconsin, we do not have those long term ones. We do not have contracts. DOC does not have contracts for all of those. We have some in the Twin Cities, but of course they're on probation. They can't go to Minnesota for a year, be in treatment court. That's kind of an issue. Um, so with the fentanyl issue, we can hold them in our jail. It's costing us money to keep them safe. They're going for a month. Then they're going to aftercare, sober houses, that kind of stuff. But it's just not long enough for some of these people. Um, so that's why we are kind of asking the public defender's office. Also, the DA's office is now really looking at their referrals and how they are offering plea agreements and stuff like that on 
targeting these people way sooner or saying, hey, treatment court might not be the best option right now, but if it doesn't work, we need to do this immediately before it gets that far. I think that's all my updates. Thank you. Are there any questions of Kate? Out of the 16, Kate, how many would you characterize in this kind of high, high risk? I have three right now that are fentanyl cases. Um, two of them are currently in custody because they just cannot stop and getting new charges and waiting for inpatient beds. Those are six to eight weeks. We do not want to house them in the jail, but we don't have any other option because now they're picking up new charges when they are out. Um, right now we have three on the waiting list of no fault of our own, but those all three are long-term residential people that need to start our program to go to residential, do that for about three to four months in Exodus House after that, sober living, and then they come into our program. So they're gonna be in our program for over two years at this point. And it should be about a year to 18 month program. I, I do wanna say one thing, um, and just and for some, many of people here will know this, but um, as to some of the, the, uh, I'm off, I'm used to being muted. Um, anyway, uh, the, one of the things too, just from our perspective is a chunk of our referrals were with people that were on supervision uh, that we would refer um, for review. Uh, is now, it seems to be the position here, that door is closed uh, in the sense of if DOC is not endorsing this as a potential option, even if they're accepted, um, then if they're not gonna be reviewed, well then we've lost the, the ability to kind of refer a good chunk of the participants that we normally would. So if that's the position of the county that's, uh, that's or the treatment court team that's gonna be doing, well, just be aware then we're not gonna be referring many people for treatment court uh, that are on supervision because uh, obviously uh, what, the reason why we normally do it is because they're being revoked and DOC has taken a position about you know their position, which is fair. Uh, we have a different position. Uh, and so then we're basically then, if you're looking for the defense team to basically be uh, referring people, we're only talking about you know pre-plea people uh, at that point then, um, which really limits our ability to kind of refer. And so I just wanna make that kind of point of, that's probably why some of that well is, is drying up. This yeah, really yeah. just came up recently. Um, most of our people that come into treatment court are ATRs from treatment court where, I mean from probation, where probation's fully in support of them doing treatment court. But every once in a while you have a violation that's too serious for public safety or integrity of the program where DOC doesn't support it, and then it's up to the ALJ judge. So in this, in a recent case, the ALJ approved an ATR to treatment court, and then actually on appeal, they said no, it was too serious, and um, it went to sentencing. Thank you. Any other questions or comments of Kate or Mr. Satorius, Mr. Anderson? Uh, TAD grant update, Lisa. Good morning. Um, so with our TAD grant, it is uh, getting to be October, which is the busiest month for us for TAD and the application process. Our grant for 2025 will be due October 21st. Uh, Phil, Kate, and I meet monthly to discuss um, treatment court diversion and justice support. Uh, we work collaboratively together on um, all of those projects. So we are looking at for 2025 requesting uh, a little more funds for uh, AODA assessments and residential treatment as Kate discussed um, the issues revolving individuals getting into treatment and long term treatment. So we have some requests for that and then we also are going to be requesting an additional data entry specialist um, that will be funded through TAD for uh, diversion or treatment court to um, get additional assistance in entering data into core and collecting 
other information for us for, so that we have more uh, ability to determine you know, all the success of the programs. And with that being said, they have a million dollars that will be additional for 2025 um, with the amount of counties that received TAD. We don't know if we will you know, be get that request or not, but obviously we're going to put it in as showing as it, it's a need. Uh, Phil did submit the pre-application in August, uh, but we haven't heard back on that quite yet, but that might also be because right now the DOJ is working uh, diligently on the diversion performance measures work group. We are putting together a specific diversion program outcomes and performance measures manual so that diversion programs have more of a guide specifically for those types of programs. Generally in the past they've used treatment court which is on the other end of the spectrum so it's best to separate those and, and tally up what people would want for data entry as two separate programs. Also, the TAD grant quarter three report will be due on October 12th. Um, I believe from our conversations yesterday that everybody's on track, that um, the funds are on track. And I don't know if Phil might have anything else to say about that piece. No, I don't think so. Um, no, nothing else. With the diversion program specifically, we do have an intern. Her name is Kelly Altman, so she might be walking around with Phil, Jenna, or I, and if you happen to see her, I'll introduce her. Um, she'll be with us until December. And um, otherwise, hopefully we'll have that uh, diversion manual complete by the end of the year. I'm guessing that DOJ will want to put it in the 2025 TAD application. Questions of Lisa about uh, the TAD grant? Hearing none. Uh, the MAT grant updates. MAT, again, medically assisted treatment. Uh, Bob Rarid is going to address that. And just to kind of as a side story, I had a jury trial recently where uh, a person who was called up to the box, last name was Rarid. And I thought, well, that's kind of a unique name. I wonder if it's any uh, relation to. Uh, uh, our Director of Behavioral Health and Human Services, and so you go through the questioning and nothing, 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 and then I ask a question if anyone on the panel knew anyone from the department, because this case involved a, a department, and a hand goes up, and I said, well, uh, yes, who do you know and how? She said, well, let's start with the director, and I said, okay. So anyway, we welcomed her. She was struck, unfortunately, because she knew too many people at the department, but. Uh, uh, we welcomed her to that uh, jury experience. Bob, what can you share about uh, medically assisted treatment? Thank you, Judge. I'm glad I came in useful <laughs> for my wife's sake. Uh, as far as the uh, funding for MAT, we are applying for a state opioid response grant. Um, Natalie Radich is here, and she's been working on that. We apply every year that it's available, and so far I've gotten it. Um, the next round of uh, funding for SOR should be for a three-year period, so we won't have to reapply every year. And we anticipate, based on our conversations or Natalie's conversations with uh, the, the state, that we will get it. However, the timing of that is going, the announcement for awards probably won't come out until November. So we won't have the money in hand to pay for that. However, if there's a, um, relatively minimal gap in funding between when uh, the current grant funding runs out and when the SOR, State Opioid Response Grant funding, kicks in, we'd be willing to continue the services there. I believe there's enough medication, Vivitrol, for a while. I don't know how long, Phil, but for a few weeks at least uh, to sustain that, and that's the primary expense. So we'd be, in, we'd be contributing staff time and um, the other ancillary efforts that go along with that project until we get the grant announcement. There's always a chance we won't get it, but it looks very promising or else I wouldn't be so f quick to offer. <laughs> uh, but that should sustain the program then, I, I believe, for another three years if we get that money. 
Uh, well, thanks uh, to Bob and uh, Natalie and Phil and others because that, again, was a, a program that uh, we thought was coming to an end because the federal funding had, had run out. And so creative minds come up with creative solutions. So we appreciate, hopefully, uh, the award of the grant and, and use of some of those monies from the opioid settlement to continue that program. and. You know, every now and then I have someone in court, as I'm sure Judge Waterman and others, who said they're participating in this program while they're in jail. And uh, so it is being used, and I think its uh, effectiveness uh, speaks for itself. So any questions, uh, Bob, about the MAT program? Uh, next is uh, we asked uh, Sheriff Knudsen to give us kind of a, an update, an overview, a, a presentation on uh, uh, the jail uh, primarily. I think it's a good segue from what Kate was saying about uh, folks who are now in jail and uh, what I understand to be a, a growing population. Uh, the sheriff gave a presentation at Public Protection Committee a couple of months ago about what I think is maybe the next phase of our expansion here at the Government Center. Uh, I think you're all aware that the south end, I believe, is planned to open on Monday. Uh, they'll be testing fire alarms today, so be prepared for that if you're in the building. Uh, my insurance company is very pleased because the judges will have underground parking and I won't be making another hail claim, which I've made for the last two years, uh, parking outside, so I appreciate that uh, to the uh, county administrators and others. But uh, with our growing population and with, uh, unfortunately, the influx of what I found is much more violent crimes and serious crimes uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, unfortunately, jail expansion, I think, is now uh, on the horizon. So we've asked the sheriff to kind of uh, brief this group. We are, in essence, in my mind, kind of the eyes and the ears of the community on the Community Justice uh, uh, Council. And so I thought this would be a good venue for him to uh, offer up uh, what at least is the next plan. Sheriff. Thank you. Um, my PowerPoint, uh, I wasn't able to get working, so I'm gonna throw out a bunch of numbers, but also kind of explain the evolution of our jail population and how it has uh, really continued to grow over the last five, 10, 15 years. Um, 1993, obviously this building was opened up along with the jail, moved from downtown Hudson um, up here, and at that time it was 131 inmates. Um, that was our max capacity. In 2003, we added a Huber addition. That added another 44 beds to our unit. Um, and then in 2019, we added nine more in the special needs area. But all of those conversions uh, within the footprint um, have been at the expense of something that was built that wasn't intended for that uh, duty. For example, the nine special needs cells, uh, we had to put those where the gymnasium was, so we had to remove the gym in order to put special needs cells. We then took the uh, activity portion for the inmates and put that into a classroom. So some equipment was put in there for them to work out. Um, and classrooms have a bit evolved to online things, but we still need classrooms. So we're kind of um, cannibalizing within. So as we look at um, not only the structure, more importantly, we look at the number of inmates that and the separation of those inmates within the building. Um, some of the what we talk about, that's one of the alarms that Judge Needham had mentioned. So. They're working. Um, Wisconsin DOC, they have guidelines um, for operating at functional capacity. Uh, and that's a word that while we can house 184 completely full, functional capacity is 80% of that, which our functional capacity is 147. Um, and how jails are being built now, uh, they are built for more classification and separation. 
So we have pods. We have a pod, but we have day rooms and cells. Uh, so one of our day rooms, there's 24 inmates in there. That's one TV. That's one um, phone. Uh, so they're not building them that way anymore. They're building, Trumpelow County, there's four and six in the dorms. Helps so much more with classification. Um, and we'll get into the numbers of classifications and the separations that need to be in a moment. Um, so once the daily population consistently exceeds 150 inmates, we have to start preparing for housing outside the county, moving some of those inmates. So we kind of remain within that functional capacity. Tempers flare, 24 people in a room. Um, as the jail inspector, when he came through to do our annual inspection, he says, you can feel the tension in here because of the amount of inmates. That also eats into and um, makes us juggle more uh, mental health uh, as they come in, our mental health workers. They only have so much time to speak with people. The more people they have to see, the shorter time to see each one or see them at all on certain days. We don't have 24 hour coverage for mental health or for jail medical. Um, so it's a juggling act for them as well. So today's population is 135. 126 of those are in-house. We do have Huber. Um, 136 was the average daily population for August. So we're at 135 today, so it's very similar. We're remaining consistent. However, we have spikes. Um, a couple weeks ago, we had on a Monday 17 in intake. Uh, so we brought in a number of people over the weekend, 17 still remain that would have been new to be seen by a judge on the Monday. Um, I believe there was one day that we had 153 for a population. So we are just teetering on that board right now. Um, and to break that down, I grabbed a day uh, in August that was 143 for population. 131 of those were county inmates because we also host Department of Corrections, DOC, those coming to and from boot camp. There are some that are here um, maybe for another county, waiting to go to another county, have waived extradition, waiting to go to another state. Um, and then, of course, our Huber inmates. And our Huber runs about, our high has been 10. Um, back in 2003, when we built that Huber edition, that was the belief that Huber was, so we put in 44. And those dorms, they house 16 to 18 in each one. And that's dormitory style. So we're currently housing lower classification inmates from the pod that are not Huber in a dorm style just because we're full down at the pod. So there's that separation again. Nobody's locked down at night. It's a dorm dormitory style. So we, we are getting full. Um, 136 was the average for May. March was 132. We're, we're just fluctuating in there. And as we break down those numbers within, um, in August, we had four inmates that were on active 15-minute suicide watches and 23 inmates that were on 60-minute medical or mental health watches keeping them all separate if we can. Um, we're dealing with one inmate that he gets put in the special needs cells, does well. We have people that are higher need, move him back. He starts to fight in the block. He cannot get along with, with people. Um, it's, it's a challenge as we're trying to uh, really take care of the, the highest needs as best we can. And we have to break down those four people and 23 people on those 60 minute watches. Um, those weren't just a day, they were multiple days. So in August, we had 125 
um, individual days where we had somebody on a 60 minute mental health watch. So 125 instances that throughout the 30 day month we were moving people and rehousing people. Um, breaking it down, um, prior to COVID, we were already at 141 inmates uh, with the highest single total that time was 153. So very similar to now. And in a lot of our, in, we, we had a jail study done to try to figure out where we were at and what the future was gonna hold. So we took a six year span, but we threw out 2020 because you really can't. That was such an odd time. We moved many out. Um, EHM was used, it was, it was really a separation experiment. But we learned some things from that. Um, one of the things we used was, um, really came into more uh, remote court, remote um, hearings, uh, special needs hearings or mental health hearings or, um, so that became part of our repurposing of some of the rooms within, so again, one of the Huber officers' offices became a Zoom room. The Huber locker room, the old Huber locker room became a Zoom room for a court. So um, the estimations by the year 2045, based upon the numbers and what we've looked at over the last six years, they anticipate the average daily population range will be between 141 to 168 inmates. They put the peaking numbers between 169 and 201 inmates. Based on the Department of Corrections 80% guidelines, we should have a total bed capacity of 212 to 252 beds by 2045. As I mentioned right now, we do 184, but again, that separation and classification uh, is almost impossible to do to remain within those guidelines and recommendations. 76% of the inmate admissions stay less than four days. The remaining 24% use over 50% of total days stayed. So 76%, they're within the four. So when we look at our consistent numbers, that's a lot of that 50%. 75% of the admissions were males and 25% were females. I go back to in 1996 when I started, we had one block at the pod for females, and those were four cells. They weren't always full. We, we joked, that's F block, that was the female block. There's only, and then here comes meth and the crimes that come with that addiction, the thefts, the burglaries, the identity thefts. Um, so now we're at 25% uh, the female population. So that has, that has changed in my career and I'm sure Judge Needham also has seen that change. In 2023, there were 2,769 bookings, which is a rate of seven and a half bookings per day. And of the inmates with mental health special watches, two thirds of those were male, one, one third of those were female. The Department of Corrections has identified 16 different separate classifications per sex. Meaning the jail must control and must contend with 32 possible separation scenarios. Uh, two of our toughest separation issues are co-defendants and inmates of the same classification that no longer can exist in the same housing area. So we have the regular classification separations, male, female, and then we write below each one of those categories. And as we know, those categories are now getting mixed. And Heather and I have spoken even yesterday about the challenges of male-female placement when transgender or in the process of. Um, and even that is not a clear, bright line through state guidelines. We're doing the best we can to make everybody as safe as we can to include the person um, male, female, but the rest of those that they are housed with as well. And below male, female, then we have to separate by 
minimum, medium, and maximum classification, and then Huber. And then we don't get down into the subclassifications. We go back into what I just mentioned, the co-conspirator, co-defendant, but the special needs with mental health, special needs um, that uh, need that mental health, medical health, uh, people that can't live with others. I just mentioned one that because behavioral, um, we have gang affiliation. If we get a former law enforcement in, which has happened, um, there's that classification, high profile, We've had several high profiles, suicide watches, um, and the list kind of goes on. So uh, we are kind of in a new planning phase of what comes next. Those of you that have been through the jail um, know our, have seen our booking and receiving area. Our receiving area has three cells. Um, one, I always say, uh, when, and, and the, when the place was built, those three receiving cells anticipated were for that separation after a fight, detox, medical mental health watches. We didn't have cells specific for any of those concerns other than those three. Um, when Schaffhausen back in 2013 was housed, he remained in one of those cells for 13 months. We were down to two cells that we had to juggle and move and prioritize. Um, with that came the challenge of um, contraband getting into the jail. There are jails now that are being built that when somebody comes in the door, um, they remain in a receiving cell up in the receiving area for separation from the general population. For example, I mentioned we had 17 on intake the one day. Each one of those 17 would have been in their own cell awaiting court. If, after court, they were had a bond or being held, then they would go back into general population. What that helps and assists with is um, the introduction of contraband, as well as if somebody is um, still suffering the effects of um, intoxication, whether it be drug or alcohol, lets them kind of move through that and be in a better place to get down into a general housing area. Um, but again, we only have three to kind of do that. When somebody gets booked in, now they go right down to the pod. They go right back, right into 24 other people, or based on classification, 20 or eight. We just, we just don't have the separation that we need right now. We do have a body scanner um, that has helped tremendously. For example, several uh, month, two ago, uh, there was a female that had brought in a syringe filled with fentanyl, and she had secreted that inside a body cavity, uncapped. If we would not have had that body scanner, that syringe full of fentanyl would have made it back into where we're housing females, which is the old Huber dorms, which do not have cells, which is dormitory style. So that syringe full of fentanyl would have gotten back in among seven other females. Without a doubt, we would have had, I believe, at least an overdose, if not more of a tragedy. So um, that's that scanner has helped tremendously, um, but it's not the end all. It's, we are hoping for good catches. We are hoping for um, the ability to see items within a person that they're trying to bring in. Some people will, knowing full well that they're going to jail, bag it up, swallow it, and then in three days they pass it, and then they utilize it within the jail. So. Um, challenges as we look to a potential expansion the idea is to add 10 percent receiving cells so of a of an area of 200 280 full capacity we're looking for 28 receiving cells so when people come in they can remain we can monitor if they need to pass something they can before they get down um, so part of looking forward is preparing for safety of 
as best we can everybody within the facility. Um, uh, Shelby had sent me some statistics of our current population breakdown, um, and this she sent me last Friday. Of the 136-ish that we have, um, 33 of those are on probation currently, and that's the reason they're being held is for probation. 28 are on pretrial. Pretrial and probation, 33. Serving, 28. Bail revoked, 6. Other county warrants, 3. And then throw in the, the remaining four. Um, so m much of ours is probation and pretrial, uh, with only 28 of our 136 currently serving. Um, so thanks to Shelby, that kind of gave me a a good good idea. And the reason she coordinated this and um, kind of gave us an idea. We have another jail project going on and that's putting that mesh screening on the second tiers uh, in hopes of preventing or uh, reducing people jumping over, uh, attempting self-harm, fighting, throwing somebody else over the top tier. So we have to look at, because of our population, housing at least 20 inmates in another county as this project goes, this project is starting um, in the next couple weeks, next month and we'll be done by January. So we're trying to figure out who we can move with the least amount of disruption in order to make certain areas a bit more safe. So I threw a lot of numbers and a lot of statistics out. Um, I wish I would have had a PowerPoint so you could actually visualize it as I was able to do, which was impactful for me. Um, but that is kind of the state of the jail right now. Maybe I'll add for you, Sheriff, um, what that process looks like then. I think you did a good job spelling out the needs within the jail. Um, the county board hears me all the time tell them um, how good the uh, county is with all the growth we have, which is really great, but the downside of that is the expenses that come with growth, and this is one of those expenses that's coming up for us. Um, if you look at the county's overall population, we're projected to exceed Eau Claire County by 2030. Um, so the county's growing fast, um, and if you look at what Eau Claire County has for courts and for jail capacity, I mean, we're going to have the same population that we're serving by that time. So we can plan ahead that we need to get up to that size. So it's really inevitable that as the population grows, the prison population grows. It's all directly related, really, in the end. So that's what the sheriff is experiencing um, and compounded by... Um, the old design with new standards. So the um, county board does have within their five-year plan uh, the jail project on there slated for 2027. Um, and that may seem like it's a long ways away, but really 23 months from now is when the county board is going to be voting to approve that. Um, and what we do with that time and what the sheriff has been doing is doing the jail study, providing the background information, uh, building support, building the knowledge base, so that the elected officials are able to make an informed decision at that point in time. And so that's where it's at. 2027 would be the start of design and build would probably start late that year, the next year, and probably take two years then. And, you know, as we, we, we did our, every year we need to do um, an inspection by the Public Protection Committee by statute. Um, they have to walk through the jail. Um, we produce the jail roster. They look for cleanliness, housing, um, anything that they see that doesn't fit um, really our, our mission. Um, and I, I remember hearing back when I first started, um, so this, this building project that we're s currently sitting in, uh, I, I believe was starting to get looked at in 88, 89, 90, uh, with opening in 93. Um, we were told, and it shows in certain areas, it screams in certain areas, that when the project came for this building, um, the what were the wants and the needs, 
uh, the price was what a bit more than they wanted so they said everything gets reduced by 10% size so we originally those that have been down in the now old sheriff's office um, we had jails uh, we had um, vehicle stalls garages that would not fit a car with a push bumper we had to remove walls to fit cars the current sally port of the jail does not fit an ambulance if we have a medical the ambulance can back in but we can't shut the door or we take them out to the ambulance um, so that was as we look this room should have been 10 percent larger the courtroom should have been 10 percent larger everything was cut down it worked for 30 years but we now really feel that pinch questions uh, of the sheriff or the county administrator uh, i think as the sheriff uh, suggested the, the not only is the population growing but the population is changing um, the number of again people with mental illnesses uh, is increased exponentially since i've been here and the fact that i think all of our specialty cells are filled and probably others who might um, take advantage of that type of setting you know we see it every day um, courtrooms one and four i think as everyone knows do not have access to the jail and so we try as best as we can to do as much remotely as possible uh, but again that has challenges uh, in terms of attorneys being able to talk to their clients uh, uh, that face-to-face -face interaction that i think all judges would prefer as opposed to looking at somebody over a tv screen so uh, it is a need that I think is is upon us and I appreciate the county board has put this on their plan going forward uh, and you know Eau Claire County has six judges so if we're gonna be the same size as Eau Claire in the next uh, six years we have four judges so it's going to happen um, and it's one of those realities again of growth. So thank you to the sheriff for his presentation and the support that the administrator and the county board at least to this point are showing uh, for recognizing that need. Any other questions or comments? Uh, we thought that we were gonna have somebody here from Turning Point uh, today, but uh, they're not here. So that will eliminate that on our agenda. Uh, subcommittee reports, executive committee, I think everyone knows meets, although uh, we have recently decided that potentially uh, Phil and I will meet and Kate and uh, look at agendas for our general meetings uh, and then send out an email to the executive committee if we need to meet we certainly will do that but we're you know all of us don't need another meeting on our calendar and so uh, we are going to explore trying to make those particular meetings may be more efficient and and effective in terms of the results but as we sit here our next meeting is on october 31 uh, generally in my courtroom over the lunch hour but that is subject to change criminal justice judge waterman i'll report on uh, three items uh, first we added uh, shelby hilden as a voting member um, so much of our work goes through justice services so it was only appropriate to have her uh, formally involved uh, second, we're also looking at um, uh, courtesy testing uh, at Justice Services by uh, other law enforcement agencies, uh, cities, uh, villages, et cetera. Um, that is something that's uh, ongoing. And then last, uh, we're actively looking at revising standard bond language uh, with the Clerk of Court's office so that um, bond language is consistent and all of our partners in the justice system understand what it all means and what our responsibilities are. So those are uh, two ongoing projects. Thank you. Any questions of Judge Waterman? Uh, treatment court, uh, we heard from Kate already. Anything else to report, Kate, from treatment court? Um, I think the only thing that me and Judge Nordstrand are working on is new termination paperwork, our orders, how our process is working. So we are working on our team with that, and then it'll go to subcommittee. Thank you, and I don't know if Judge Waterman mentioned, but I think his next meeting is October 7 at noon, and treatment court next meeting is October 2nd at noon. And again, these are open to anyone to attend, and uh, 
observe and uh, maybe have a better sense as to what happens. Domestic violence, uh, Judge Flack is not here, Phil. Sure, so our next domestic violence subcommittee meeting is um, Wednesday, September 25th, so two weeks from yesterday at 11.30 in the new county boardroom. Um, at least that's tentatively where I have it scheduled. I th think there's a different process, but that's where we're gonna be for right now. Um, the DA's office will be doing a, a little brief presentation regarding how they process domestic violence cases. Um, yeah, so please come out. Any questions of Phil? Um, Juvenile Justice Child Welfare Subcommittee, we have Anjali Patel, Assistant Corporation Counsel, who chairs that uh, subcommittee, Ms. Patel. Thank you, Judge. Um, our last meeting was in early July. We meet every few months. Um, we have added Kyle Schaefer as a new member. He is the new Hudson Municipal Court Judge. Um, recently, we've completed guides on navigating CPS cases for parents to use. We finished them quite a while ago, but there was a printing error, so they've only been used for about a month now. Um, initial reports from parents are that they have been helpful in navigating these cases. Um, we are continuing to look at youth justice initiatives across the state, see if any of those initiatives can be brought here to St. Croix County. Um, and we are primarily continuing to focus on truancy issues as that remains a significant area of concern. Our next uh, meeting is scheduled for October 3rd at noon. I think we're gonna be in room 1700, but I'm not 100% sure with the move now. No, I've, I've moved that. Yeah, we will not be there. Okay. Uh, I've also moved that to the new county boardroom just temporarily, um, so I'll provide an update on that. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Any questions to Ms. Patel about uh, the work of, of their subcommittee? Uh, behavioral health, Mr. Rarid. Thank you, Judge. Uh, we last met in July, and at that meeting, um, Ailey, Peters, Ailey Peterson, the uh, CEO for Western Wisconsin Health, provided an update on some regulatory challenges that the hospital was facing. Uh, the bottom line is that they were having challenges with billing for substance use disorder treatment because of conflicting chapters within uh, uh, state law so or licensing uh, requirements. The bottom line is they resolved that and uh, I believe you're able to start billing in uh, around January for substance use disorder care and they're building up that area of their behavioral health um, wing. Uh, we also discussed um, let me see. We also discussed uh, a dementia crisis stabilization unit grant that we were <clears throat> applying for in July. This would be a grant that would allow us to open the Kitty Rhodes Dementia Care Facility at the healthcare campus. Um, initially, it was a $300,000 grant, <clears throat> excuse me, that we were applying for. Uh, we ended up getting additional monies for that. Uh, the final grant amount was $600,000. That will allow us to do a lot of the startup costs related to uh, opening Kitty Roads for dementia care, uh, provide some staff incentives, equipment, um, furniture, all of that stuff. So um, that's uh, tentatively, we're hoping to open that unit in early January, or early January of 25. So uh, it's a 10 bed, if you're not familiar with Kitty Roads, it's a 10 bed facility at the healthcare campus and it's already designed for this kind of care. So it's a lot of just filling in the, the missing pieces here to get it up and going. I'm gonna put my glasses back on. Hmm. Um, also discussed a couple of legislative bills that passed in the last session that would affect behavioral health care. one of which was uh, Act 249, which was for uh, where the uh, legislature required DHS to move forward with developing two regional crisis urgent care and observation facilities with the western region of the state being a priority. What that involves though is it involves DHS now writing administrative rule language around this new level of care. Uh, they received $10 million for startup money uh, for two, I, I think two regional observation facilities. Uh, it's not very much money so it could maybe operate a couple for maybe two years uh, once the administrative rule, probably a year and a half, two year process to write this rule language and actually put out RFPs and implement it. Uh, there needs to be sustainability um, for this kind of project or some kind of incentive for providers to want to do it. And I don't see that yet. And the other, quickly, the other uh, legislative item was um, 
the legislature also required DHS to apply for an 1115 waiver, which is a waiver to allow Medicaid spending in institutions for mental disease like Winnebago. Currently, you can't use Medicaid funding to pay for client stays or person stays in Winnebago or any IMD facility without a waiver. The waiver process also will take likely two years. Uh, it would allow for Medicaid to cover stays in Winnebago for Medicaid eligible folks, uh, hopefully up to 30 days uh, per month. Uh, a lot of times these waivers are written to only cover 15 days per month for each individual. Uh, just a side note to that too, Winnebago's rates have gone up or will go up by t in October by 10%. So the per diem rate for Winnebago right now or in October will be about $1,500 a day. There's an additional enhanced fee of some kind for the first couple of days uh, of $500. So anyone placed in Winnebago, it's going to cost us uh, $2,000 a day for the first two days and then $1,500 a day after that. So uh, there's a lot of um, interest in this particular piece of legislation that could help us offset a lot of those expenses with Medicaid dollars. And then lastly, I was going to talk uh, briefly about the white paper. We were working on a white paper for the last year around redesign of, um, redesign of the criminal justice crisis care system that we currently uh, utilize. And uh, bottom line is we're trying to look at research and data that would support new approaches uh, to people entering the criminal, criminal justice system with behavioral health needs and how we could better serve them and reduce, as the sheriff was talking about, reduce the number of people in jail and instead divert them to uh, behavioral health care that would be more appropriate for their needs. Um, Ellie Clausen was our epidemiologist at the time we started this effort and was very helpful with lit searches and data uh, and research of all kinds around this. And then she was promoted to our health officer position with public health. And after that, lacked the time to devote to this effort, at least right now. So I talked with uh, the group and uh, they agreed to pause this until we had uh, the resources and time to really devote to it. However, Phil is uh, willing to continue this effort and we've shared a lot of the data and research articles that we've collected with him and I appreciate the uh, effort there, Phil, and we'll continue to help when we can around that. Last thing I'll mention is uh, we also got a grant for a public health vending machine that we're going to place in the vestibule, the entrance of the, of the uh, services center. That uh, public health vending machine will have products like Narcan, fentanyl test strips, <clears throat> um, drug disposal kits, a lot of the things that you've seen around the county. Um, and some other items that would fit with the prevention or harm reduction kind of um, uh, theme. And we should get that vending machine in the next uh, few weeks as soon as they build it and uh, have that available. So it would be free of charge products for people that come into the services center. They could, uh, in a semi-private way, just uh, choose a product and have it dispensed and then we'll track that through software. I think that's it, Judge. Thank you. Uh a vending machine for Narcan, our new reality, I think. Uh, any questions of uh, Mr. Rarit? Thank you. Well, that completes the formal agenda. Um, if you have, again, requests for future agendas, uh, Phil, I, the executive committee, are always looking for ideas or suggestions um, to basically engage uh, this group and and to promote you know, our work, so never hesitate to reach out. I don't have any announcements other than our next meeting will be in the new county board room. So uh, as of Monday, as I understand, what is now the main entrance will be closed and we'll be using the new main entrance. Uh, county board room, once you come through security, will be just uh, diagonally uh, to your left. Um, First floor uh, will then start to be gutted and remodeled. I think my understanding is that we'll still have access to the courts through our current stairwell and elevators for about three weeks was my understanding. But then starting about mid-October, you'll go through up the stairs, uh, the elevators in the new building, and then through the doorway that is being built uh, that will then access uh, 
the second floor. So there's a lot of moving pieces to this entire project, but it is really, really coming together and uh, quite incredible what, what's been done and what I think is a very short period of time. So we'll look forward, I think, in part to uh, having that process start. Uh, so our next meeting currently is scheduled for November 14th. That may be changing folks as I think that's the week of judicial conference. It's the week, I think, of the State Public Defenders Conference, maybe the week for DA's conference. We all generally try to schedule that same time frame to eliminate impact on the court. So I'll be talking to Phil and others, but be tuned in. That date may, may change. Any other business to come before this body? Thank you all very much. We're adjourned. <laughs>